Happy New Year and welcome to The Advocate on PLUS TV Africa. Your reminder that important conversations are among the necessary truths for a sinner society. Today, I'm talking about the legacy President Buhari is looking to leave once his tenure comes to an end. Helen educates us on the need for monitoring applied behavior analysis services in Nigeria. Adenrili Edwards is here to tell us about the silent killer in our midst. And finally, Elijah brings up the never-ending discussion on gender equality. As always, your panelists are here to share ideas aimed at provoking thoughts with no holes barred. Stay with us. Visualizing the emerging legacy of President Muhammadu Buhari. When asked what would be his legacy during a rare interview last year, President Muhammad Buhari knew well to concede that responsibility to Nigerians, even though he begged to be assessed fairly. As the administration enters its final and usually least impactful spell for obvious reasons, many Nigerians, I suppose, are gearing up to exercise that responsibility. Until his historic victory as the seventh democratically elected president of Nigeria in 2015, the then General Muhammad Buhari was the best president Nigeria never had. Such was a wide perception held of the man until he was assigned what was easily his life's ambition, presiding over Nigeria as a democratic leader. But between then and now, that hope and optimism that encircled his persona has given way to despondency and disillusionment. The reason is not far-fetched. For a man that ran a popular campaign around the tripod of stand, stamping out corruption, decimating Boko Haram, and economic recovery, it is crushing for Nigeria and Nigerians that under his watch, Nigeria has fared worse on each of those indices. Some have argued that the worst form of corruption in a multicultural setting like Nigeria is presiding over an exclusionary government that appears to alienate people of other ethnic and or religious persuasion. Yet, that has been the order of the Muhammad Buhari regime. Despite being a former military general and leveraging same to contend that Nigeria would be safer under him pre-2015, we have witnessed a Nigeria with shrunken territories due to the activities of non-state actors in various parts of the country. Boko Haram has not only defied decimation, it has arguably grown with a splinter cell, ISWAP, proving even more deadly. And as one travels from one region of the country to the other, a new wave of insecurity is met. Banditry in the Northwest, sessionist tensions in the Southeast, militancy in the Niger Delta, Boko Haram insurgency in the Northeast. The economic scorecard doesn't look good either, with our slipping into the poverty capital of the world according to the global poverty clock under the administration, being the clearest evidence of that. As we begin the new year, with time no longer on the side of the President Muhammad Buhari administration. The question then is, will some, if not all the above, become the defining pillars of the Buhari legacy? From my cautiously optimistic standing, there is no reason not to resolve that poster in the positive. But what do you say? Wow, Raymond. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to say these things before I respond to your ideas on yeah. President Buhari. Yeah. Let me first of all tell President Buhari, this is the first time I'm saying this to him directly. I know if he's watching us, yeah. happy birthday, Baba, even though it's in areas. Yeah. Uh, so the Lord is your strength. So however, I have these things to say. I've been looking for an opportunity to meet with Buhari. If I have one, I have some things to tell him. And okay. uh, let me say it now. You talked about the three things, stamping out corruption. Mm -hmm. Somehow, Baba Buhari, have you noticed that most of your policies are like throwing away baby with the bathwater. You want to fight corruption, good intention, but most everybody suffer because you want to fight corruption. And then we have another one, the, the second one you talked about, uh, remind me. Economy. Economy. No, economy. no before economy, there is one that I quite about security. Yeah. Good. Insurgency, very big one. Yeah. Yes, we know he's a general, a very, very uh, tough general, yeah. but times have changed okay. and times will always change. You can't use the strategies you use during those days as a military general then mm -hmm. in, in keeping the peace to keep peace in this ideological dr driven uh, situation now they said guns can kill terrorists but education 
we kill terrorism. So what these people need is adequate education, carrot and stick method. Yeah. So these are things. It's not only buying super to cano. Today we buy super to super, 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 super cano aircraft, yeah. this and that. Not only that. What are they doing to reorientate the mindset of the people there? And why doing the right things? And then the other one of economy. Yeah. Uh, well, to make Nigeria an economic giant, its policies, you cannot move the economy without involving the youth. Look at what happened during the Sorosoke saga. Yeah. The youth were trying to talk to him. You didn't want to listen. The next thing was to punish us by, by what? Banning Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Twitter. thereby, uh, let me, I will not even come to Twitter yet. That was another. Thereby disenfranchising us from participating in the global economy. Yeah. Why must it be only crude oil that we think of exporting or importing? Do you know we can actually export knowledge? That's why we have the dot, we're in the dot com era. Yeah. You can actually be in, the, in your room and then solve group, uh, problems yeah. that the company can use there because of our policies. It's difficult to send money outside or even receive money inside. How can you now grow the economy? How? So these are the things you should look at. And number four, too, I, I, this one is not in the list, but okay. I see it as a behavioral approach. Our president, our dear president, is sometimes swift to dealing with persons from some certain region when they speak up against the government or when they misbehave yes. as a no-nonsense general he is speak to send soldiers there and or do things to call them to order but when it comes to giving sanction <coughs> to countries to to to, to impress this uh, to um to uh, uh, enhance this perf uh, perception that we are truly the giant of africa let me give you an example it's like found one thing the issue of xenophobic attack on Nigerians, that was uh, 2019, if I'm yes. not mistaken. In South Africa. In South Africa. What did he do? Imagine you, you were the one that went to visit the South African president. Somebody committed a crime or, or killed your person, and then you, who is supposed to visit who? And you went there. For what? Why can't you? I expected him to take a, a stern move against South, Af uh, South Africa. Maybe by expelling this uh, ambassador or something mm -hmm. from the country or something, I don't know. Yeah. Or, or another instance, let me give another instance. See what happened in Ghana. Imagine the Ghanaian had the opportunity or had the ref country to raise down a Nigerian building owned by the Nigerian government in Ghana. Yeah. And then what did the president do about it? Uh, the president of Ghana apologized. Why would you do that? You, we need to send, like, build send like, a strong, strong message. message. Have a strong, stop begging. Mm -hmm. I, but, but kudos to him anyway. I love the way he handled the issue of. Uh, this is what called reciprocity in diplomacy. Mm -hmm. The issue of uh, banning, uh, the ban was from coming to Canada or something over the yeah, Ubico yeah, virus, and they responded. Okay, and so I okay, uh, should keep okay. it up. But like I said, some people believe that uh, it's too late for Buari to do anything that he has not done before in the last, that he has just one year. Yeah. So if he cannot do anything in the last seven six, years, yeah, six, what can he do now? Well, I, I believe that uh, whenever a man wakes up, it's his day. <laughs> I will give Buari a benefit of that. Baba Buari, with due respect, sir, please, you have one more year to go. Just try and do the needful. Do something very right. If possible, get young, smart guys around you. You mustn't be working with... It's not working with millennials. There's, no dis, there's a disconnect between the government and millennials. Yeah. That's why some of their policies are not youth-friendly. It doesn't make sense. So, so Helen, is there any possibility that the I, imagine I, the guys is going to change? For me, year? you know, I think the total... The whole four years has been a waste of time. Six years, actually. Six years has been a waste of time. Personally, because I have not seen every single Chibok girl returned home. Mm. Wow. Simple, I mean, I'm not really concerned about the economy. I'm yeah. not concerned about what I'm concerned about yeah. Nigerian parents mm -hmm. who have not seen their children in close to seven years. I don't think any Nigerian should go through that. And for that, he has failed for me. Anyway, for speaking about Chibok years, I know some people will say, is it Buhari? This was during Good Luck Jonathan. It's, it's irrelevant. But the truth of the matter, what I will say is, Let's learn to take responsibility. Good luck has done his own, whether he's perfect or not. He made his mistake, he made his error, he made his successes, he made his failures, he has gone. Now, Baba Boy, what are you going to do with the time you have now? No, but he so, promised us. He, he promised us. That's what made me vote for him. The girls were going yes. to yes. I voted for and him. I, and government, then he should do something about it. It's, it's it not almost too late. Is in the saddle today. It's, it's, yes, because it government is continuous. Presidents and his people, the presidents mm -hmm. should take responsibility. They kept it was PDP before they blame uh, good luck, they blame PDP, they blame the youth, they blame Twitter. What are they blaming again? COVID, COVID. Every successive um, government blames each other the government one before, before them. Mm -hmm. For me, my I mean, what really upsets me is the fact that there seems to be a lack of strategy for 
most of the policies. I don't understand the backdrop upon which they're making a lot of their decisions. So take, for instance, the amnesty given to Boko Haram. So you are rewarding them. There doesn't seem to be any plan to educate them, to reintegrate them into the society. You've just rewarded them and they've gone back to doing the same thing. I just don't understand how that kind of decision could have been could have, could have well, been well, made. Well, for me, I'm, I'm happy, like I pointed out, I'm happy that when uh, that journalist asked him that question, that what would be the Boko Haram legacy, he quite understood that it is not for him to call, that it is for Nigeria who are going to look back at his, what would be his eight years, eight years in government and take a decision one way or the other. Well, I bet and, and, I, and I think Nigerians are quite informed about what this government has done, and at the right time, they will paint that legacy. Well, I beg to him. disagree on that. Baba Buari, I will advise you like a, like, like a son. <laughs> Let me just advise you as a son. Baba, please, you should be concerned about your legacy. Forget about what Nigerians think or not. Do the right things. You know what to do. Do it. Yeah. And let me just take this for me. No this and no peace. Get a Nigerian youth. Get good Nigerian youth. Many of them, they could Root come them. work with you. It's just one year. You could do something. Change your history. Change your story. It doesn't matter what has, done, has been done in the past six years. If you can do the right things within this one year, even if you cannot do all, do something tangible that will be a build-up for the next administration. Okay, well, um, it's one year to go, and then we'll see what becomes of the Buhari legacy, ultimately. Helen is next after the break. The need for monitoring Applied Behavior Analysis Services, ABA. What is ABA? Applied Behavior Analysis, ABA, also called Behavior Engineering, is a scientific technique concerned with applied empirical approach based upon the principles of changing behavior. The behavior must be significant to the individual, family, and society at large. ABA has been utilized in a range of areas, including applied animal behavior, school-wide positive behavior support, classroom instruction, structured and naturalistic early behavior intervention for autism, pediatric feeding therapy, rehabilitation of brain injuries, dementia, fitness training, substance abuse, phobia, tics, and organizational behavior management. Presently in the United States, ABA is a medical intervention and it can only be applied by persons who are trained and certified in the application. With the alliance of other behavior analysts worldwide, we have now March 20th as the World Applied Behavior Analysis Alliance. What does this all mean? The, the implication is that if an individual has a neurodevelopmental disorder, you must put in the intervention that is done through evidence-based practices so that data can be taken to determine the effectiveness of that treatment. If this is not done, the condition becomes complicated and this is where the line between duty of care and negligence starts becoming blurred. Currently, the prevalence of children with neurodevelopmental disorders is 1 in 44, and most of these children are being attended to by unqualified persons or the person's license are not being supervised. What licenses do we have that are applicable in Nigeria currently? There are three foreign licenses bodies currently in Nigeria. You have the IBCCES, the BCBA, the QABA. There is a chain of supervision with all these bodies and this is not being applied. Technicians, assistants, program developers all report to the developer who need to understand that individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders have medical conditions that deserve the most effective treatment and, this, and if this is not done, we only make the condition worse. These are lifetime disorders and we need to give the individuals the best opportunity for the most beneficial quality of life. It is ethical and morally wrong to keep children with such conditions under the care of quacks and this, is, this needs to stop. Individuals with this condition have other medical conditions that are serious and can result in the reaction and the child might die in the care of, his, of the school. We really need to stop this practice. It is not fair to the individuals or the parents. 
learning support in schools should be monitored by ABA consultants and not just anybody who has a passion to work with a vulnerable child or group of individuals who have neurodevelopmental disorders. Well, uh, it's quite a lot. You know, <laughs> we always emphasize you are, what you're trying to see is um, the emphasis should be on getting people, professionals that are well studied or well trained to handle this issue. No, it should not just be based on passion. No, I have passion to take care of uh, children with special needs or persons with special needs. Mm. Let me go into it. You might cause more harm than good yeah. in the process. Yes, so basically now that it's a medical condition, the truth of the matter is that if a child gets worse under your care, you can actually go to prison for it. Huh. So schools really do need to understand that these children are really ill. They are medically ill. You know, people see these children as not being ill because they come to school and, you know, they behave they almost, appear normal. they appear normal. But each of these conditions have comorbid other conditions like seizures and stroke. Wow. So, so I, want, I want to find out why is, why is most of the burden being placed on the schools? Are these boarding schools or day schools? Day schools. Well, if a parent who, who has a child mm. or who has that condition and who takes the child to a particular school, I'm trying to see why the school should bear that responsibility. Especially when it's not a boarding facility where you know the child has to be there um, continuously. That's a very good, very, very good question. The truth of the matter is that if a child has a medical diagnosis, why are you allowing the child in your school in the first place? Okay. Exactly. Why are you allowing the child? All should be responsible. Well, I That's think, I mean, do we even have special needs schools? So, I, I mean, there may be the odd one, but even the special needs schools, who monitors them? What's the, um, what's the standard or the parameters that the Ministry of Education has set to say that mm -hmm. if you're going to set up this kind of school, then this is what you should have? Right. And who is making sure that they have it? Yeah. Okay, so the answer to that is that for the first 1,000 days of a child's life with a delay, they have to have the opportunity to be trained in mainstream education. Once a child gets to about seven, then you can now start streamlining into special needs schools. The challenge we have is that most parents don't want their children to be in special needs schools because of stigma, 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 stigma and kindling. Awareness, lack of awareness. Good. And the special needs schools that we have are um, overburdened with children that mm -hmm. can never be intervened. ABA is for intervention. Intervention means to restore to an extent so that the impact of the disorder is not going to be um, it's not going to be a detriment to the child further on in life. You have to properly manage the disorder. Yes. yes. So, so you I, I want to find out because it's a very interesting script. I'm trying to find out if that is that a role for you didn't mention any is that what's the Ministry of Health doing? Are they working with any development partners? to address this issue because it's quite very, this ABA whole concept is quite uh, is new. new to me. <laughs> and I imagine for most people out there, it's also very new to them. And so I don't know. The truth of the matter is that it's, it's not a new concept. It's just been taken at a higher level. Okay. So, uh, you know, when you go to school and you read special education, to some extent, you'll be taught ABA. But the empirical part of ABA has gone out of the framework of school and has now stepped into the hands of medical. For Nigeria purposes, it's best for us to start with the Ministry of Education because they are the ones totally responsible for the school settings. You know, if you want to take it through the Ministry of Health, they've got so many other things. But we can also approach the Ministry of Health for them to, 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 um, to push screening. So what we've done, well, what we do is that we've done the reverse. We are screening in schools okay. to help the children to be identified on time because to we help can't the school wait. Identify the children on time. Yes, because we can't wait. If we're going to wait for the medical profession to take this up, then we're going to have, I mean, one in forty-four. Yes. That's a lot. I think our problem majorly in Nigeria is number one awareness. Lack of Continu education, continue lack education, of public awareness. We are quick to judge, stigmatize, and discard. Mm -hmm. Number two, inclusion. Not just mm -hmm. inclusion, intentional inclusion mm -hmm. from systemic point of view and government reinforcing it. You want to build a school. You talk about special needs school. It's not easy running a special needs school. No, but let's even assume you have just a school for everyone. 
what efforts are you making to include everyone with different health challenges or whatever to be part of it to get the best out of your school well, being enforced by the government that's yeah, what it's ought to be good but the pro challenge is that and i still go back to the fact that schools don't appreciate how ill these children are if they understood how ill these children are i know a lot of schools good schools that are ready to put in protocols to help Mm. Do you understand? So I don't see a passionate um, educator knowing what we are advocating now will sit down and take those children on without the support of consultants. Okay. Okay. So I would like to ask Helen, what kind of, um, do you have the manpower to monitor those things? It's to implement. So for me, it comes down to implementation. implementation. What's the plan? How are we planning capacity, to implement? Capacity building because schools at the moment do have people monitoring these children, but those people are not being supervised. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the bridge is already there. It's just for us to make it solid. And the, mm. that's where the government has to come in. Uh, for me, Ministry for of Health. Me, for uh, Ministry of Education, collaboration with Ministry of Health. Just what you brought to you, what you brought in. Speaking from a legal point of view, you mentioned something about negligence and duty of care. Yes. So I think I would like to see where a parent who goes to court to enforce the <laughs> breach of the duty of care, of, of care by the schools, mm. and let's see what the courts how do we interpret the problem that is that no parent wants to be so, the I one. Mean, so there appears to be a conspiracy of silence. Silence. I mean, like we all know that we know who are affected. So everything else. I mean, there's a conspiracy of silence. No one wants to talk. No one wants to be the one that is sing singled out. And wow. that's really wow. sad. Wow. And they're dying in silence. There it is. Okay, after the break, we are going to go into a very, very interesting topic. And I would totally advise you to remain here. Sudden cardiac arrest, the silent killer in our midst. I don't want to sound morbid and certainly not at this time of the year when everyone is in such a festive mood. However, there is a silent killer. And though it's not limited to men, it's taken out mostly men of African descent. And it has nothing to do with age, physical fitness, or even underlying medical condition. Sudden cardiac arrest. While some people may experience symptoms such as racing heartbeat or feeling dizzy, alerting them that a potentially dangerous heart rhythm problem has started. In over half of the cases, it occurs without prior symptoms. In the past few years, a number of prominent Nigerians, such as Digi Tenumbu, Stephen Keshi, Ibiduni Igudalu, Uguchuku Ehiogu, Nigerian-born ex-England international footballer, to mention a few, have succumbed to it and died. Recently, in the international arena, the Danish footballer Christian Eriksen suffered a sudden cardiac arrest. Thankfully, he survived due to the prompt attention he received. He's doing well, and though banned from playing in Syria R, is planning to resume his career. Unfortunately, because of a lack of awareness and education, most people in Nigeria are not so lucky. I can talk from experience because my husband died of sudden cardiac arrest in 2014. He wasn't sick. He was shooting pool when he suddenly went down. No one did anything because no one knew what to do. SCA is not the same as a heart attack. Without sounding too clinical, in a heart attack, the heart stops beating. In contrast, sudden cardiac arrest occurs when the electrical system to the heart malfunctions, just like your car, and suddenly becomes irregular and blood is not delivered to the body. In the first few minutes, the greatest concern is that blood flow to the brain will be reduced so drastically that a person will lose consciousness. Death follows unless emergency treatment is begun immediately. So, how can we reduce the risk? Though it usually gives no warning, there are certain lifestyle changes you can make to reduce your risk of sudden cardiac arrest. These lifestyle changes include you quit smoking, 
lose weight, exercise regularly, follow a low fat diet, managing your underlying health conditions, including high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, and so on. What should you do if you witness sudden cardiac arrest? Immediately you initiate CPR, that's cardiopulmonary resuscitation. If done properly, CPR can save a person's life as the procedure keeps blood and oxygen circulating through the body until help arrives. If there is an AED, that's an automated external defibrillator available, the best chance of, of rescuing that person includes defibrillator with that defibrillation rather with that device. The shorter the time until defibrillation, the greater the chance the person will survive. In the first few minutes, there's actually a 75 to 90 percent chance of survival. After that, the chances reduce by 10 percent for every minute, which means in 10 minutes, a person could be dead. If CPR plus defibrillation, or it is CPR plus defibrillation that saves a person, it's far better to do something than to do nothing at all. If you are fearful, that your knowledge or abilities aren't 100% complete. Remember, the difference between you're doing something and doing nothing could be somebody's life. The person is already dead or dying, so you can't kill them. You can't do worse. So please do something. Uh, well, I must say that's really moved me. Um, it is... It's, uh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I'm emotional. I'm speechless. But um, I do, um, please, people come and do CPR. Actually, so that we, I mean, I don't know what no, to say. You know, I mean, hearing it from that point, you know, I've known Daryl for a while, and I know when her husband died, but, you know, it's only when you go through something, something. the emotions to recall that you actually know a person is dead is dead you had a heart attack and you're like so what but when you really look at what could have you're happened dying. to prevent it you ask yourself did the person really need to die you, Do you know? know that in nigeria we don't even have defibrillators especially in places where we should have them even in most hospitals it's amazing you just go and check out your local hospital. Yeah, they, do. they do not have defibrillators. So what happens? Someone is dying. They don't even but, try to shock your heart back. But the truth of the matter is that <laughs> CPR is not part of the medical training. It's done after you become a doctor in Nigeria. So are, not are you serious? Sure? Yes. So, so, not so you're jury. saying that well, some doctors don't even be, have it. I don't think no. it has to be... Um, no. Administered only, only by, by doctors. Absolutely. Yes. School, children are being taught. Yes, they're being taught. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, and, oh, yes. Uh, growing up in school, okay, all through my elementary education days, I don't recall ever being put through that the CPR procedure. And up to now, I don't know how to do it. It was when what happened with Chris and Erickson yeah. that I saw how powerful that could go, how, how, how important it is in some situation to, to save life. So, I mean, uh, it's something that we, there has to be... Uh, it has to be, has to be uh, I'll give you an example. Call to issue of awareness and, mm -hmm. and put the school system, through. church system, so people can ask, you know how to do sure. I'll give you an example. I had a training of my own personal staff. One guy, we were doing CPR training. He was there playing up and down, laughing, da, da, da. Another guy participating. Two weeks later... The guy that was laughing up and yeah. his mom had a heart attack. And he didn't sure know what, what to do. do. Oh, wow. She died. Wow. The one that was concentrating, his neighbor had a heart attack and he was able to administer CPR. And he's alive today. Wow. CPR is something wow. that that's everyone. Today, that, that's boy will feel sorry. It will feel bad. He called and he was because like a baby. He could have oh. done something. He could have done something. He could have done something. And we all can do something. It should well, start that's where education, training, education, education, education and awareness. Education and awareness. Awareness. Well, so, if you want to find out if it was intentional, you wouldn't have uh, Does he also that. have a genetic, but when you look at the causative factors, is genetics part of Some I people mean, have a higher chance. Like, a so like, I, when you look at all the people that I mentioned, they're all different. Mm. 
Mm. Look at Ericsson, for yeah. instance. You cannot he says, say he had a sedentary lifestyle. No. He's a he footballer. Well, like, he must have gone through the highest form of, of medical, medical training. training, training. Yes. Yes. And then you look at Deji Tinumbu, who was a sports person. Mm -hmm. I think that what is clear is that most of the time, when these things happen in Nigeria, people just don't know what to do because they are ill-equipped, yes, they're sure. uninformed, mm -hmm. and they lack awareness. They start running around mm -hmm. or worse still people mill around the person they're just looking at you depriving you of the much needed the oxygen and people. not doing anything or because it happens so suddenly because one minute you're just going about your business the next minute you're yeah. on the floor people people are taken Take unaware back, yes. and they just don't know, know that do, they should do, do some. something i give an example i had a very good friend he died in the gym aha uh -huh. he had a small small like a, you know yeah and that was it. By the time he got to the hospital, he said he had a cardiac arrest. Wow. And he was in Do you the know gym. what I cannot understand? I don't understand how. I mean, I know we see it in the movies. They always try to shock your heart back. And that's what the defibrillator that's the is. Defibrillator, it's supposed yes. to run electric current charge to your heart and charge it and get and it pumping again because it can. It, does, it can. It we saw it with Ericsson. Does, yeah, but in Nigeria, they just look at you mm, and uh, oh, mm, he's, he's gone. gone. They never try they never to try. bring you back. And mm. I don't know even why. The movies, even the Nigerian movies, the same Yes, yeah, the doctor will just come when, and put that When thing. you watch Hollywood, <laughs> they will use electric uh, that yes. was and most times you see them and when come back. Hollywood is, is gone. God. So it's yeah, reflective of what happens. In Nigeria, as we said as last week, I lost my stepfather. He had a cardiac arrest. Uh -huh. wow. And I'm That's very, so very hard. sure that if he had gotten to the hospital on time and they had you know what they did and he went to he went to a heart clinic a heart hospital and yeah. they didn't uh -huh. i mean i think that government needs to put certain policies in place mm. where schools hospitals churches anywhere mm. where people I mean, congregate yes. where a certain number of people gather yeah they need are to have I don't think there's any mm. in our airports. Anyway, I mean, no, our general airports. hospital has <laughs> one. Anyway, one. I, I think I will, first of all, let me appreciate you for having the courage to see this. Mm. You know, you are, it's quite sad you lost yours, but I'm yeah. sorry. Really and he didn't have to die because he was 48. Yeah, he was he young. He to rest, yeah. but you are trying to make a meaning to his death. Absolutely. I don't, you should not just die death. You know, that's what from yeah. it. And yes. so, so let's all learn as Nigerians. Let's all just learn to improve ourselves. Let's yes. do something. Yes. I, I think lifestyle is also so, one of the best safeguards. Yes, yeah, lifestyle sure. change. Yes, lifestyle like change. Instead of spending smoking, time to scream when something, something like this happens, oh, help mm. me, this and that, mm. uh, try to put and effort in. And in all fairness, you know, her sister owns a very uh, good school in Lagos, and every year. In fact, she's like, when am I doing your CPR? When are you doing, come and do um, your, sure. your, your basic life support? You know, mm. she's, oh, every year yeah. I get her timetable, mm. which is screening of the children mm. and first aid training. Okay. She doesn't, it, I, I, I know compromise. it's because of personal experience, yeah. but I also do know that it's the right thing to do. Mm. It is the right thing to do. Absolutely. It's the right well, just shortly to before you go, is there a particular reason why the men are more... Prevalent. Yes. Prevalent. Why is it so common? Among Honestly, I don't know. I'm bearing in mind I'm not a medical personnel, <laughs> so maybe we need a doctor to come. Yeah, and it's not just like it's very prevalent with men. It's more prevalent with African men. Yeah. And do you know that more people die from sudden cardiac Heart arrest in America than, than any, any other, other disease? disease? Yeah. yeah. But we lack awareness. Yes, that's yeah. the major killer, killer, natural cause of death yeah. in the entire world. Yeah. And we don't know. After the break, Elijah wraps up this conversation, and I'm looking forward to that. So stay tuned. Gender Equality B. Eliminating prejudice in lawmaking. In 2016, the Gender Equality Bill was first introduced to the 8th Senate. The bill seeks to protect the rights of widows, guarantee appropriate measures against gender discrimination in political and public scene, and prohibit violence against women in Nigeria. The bill was rejected by some male lawmakers who argued that the Nigerian constitution was clear on the rights of citizens, including women. Biodun Olujumi, Senator representing Ekiti South, however, reworked the bill and continued the pursuit in the Senate since first reading in 2019. 
after scaling second region and referred to the Senate Committee on Judiciary, Human Rights and Legal Matters, unfortunately, the bill was rejected again by some male lawmakers, claiming that the bill was against religious practice and that they can only favor gender equity over gender equality. Now, great women and men were recognized in the Quran and the Bible. So, why shouldn't we give anyone equal opportunities in contributing to the attainment of a balanced and progressive nation? More so, no human, be they male or female, is more human than any other human. So everyone deserves fairness, justice, social, economic opportunities. The strength of a state is seen in her ability to see possibilities parity in leadership offers. It also calls for the need to look beyond biases and utilize diversity to strengthen its systems. However, recent trends and happening have proven that the issue of gender equality mainstreaming is bound to be swept under the carpet as a particular gender at the helm of leadership is seen as a taboo in some certain areas. In the 21st century, where nations around the globe are searching for more advanced ways and solutions to tackling problems, some are still at the very low of thinking gender equality should, be, should not be encouraged. This anomaly begs the following question. What is our future with policies that have no place for gender equality or equality at large? Are we governed by biased belief that some sets of individuals are not fit to rule? What happens to the fundamental human rights, which stipulates right to freedom from discriminatory biases based on sex, ethnicity, or religion? These and many more are the questions roaming the minds of progressives amongst us. The issue of gender equality is a universal debate, and patriarchal system have made gender equality almost impossible. People are not supposed to be evaluated by their ethnicity or gender, but by their abilities to deliver only and if only we as a nation can see the possibilities of equality, then we are sure to be one step further in the progress ladder. In conclusion, leadership, intellectualism, greatness has no gender. It could be attained by anyone who puts in the necessary efforts. Gender equality is more than a goal in itself. It is a precondition for meeting the challenge of reducing poverty promoting sustainable development and building good governance. And that's for Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General. God rest his soul. Hmm. Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a good one. And, mm. and I agree with you on, on all counts that um, in the 21st century, we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be having the kind of conversation that we, we have in the parliament over the extent to which we are going to include women in mainstream women in politics and other facets of the society. Uh, having said that, I've not read the legislation or the bill, so I wouldn't know the angle of dissent or convergence. But I understand that whatever the case may be, some people are saying that women should not be, they should not be, that they should not be, they should only be seen, seen and heard. they should not be heard. And I think that is so obvious in, in the 21st century, it should not be heard. It just remind I was watching Al Jazeera the other day, and I saw that in Afghanistan, the current regime there has passed a law that women cannot ride more than 45 minutes yeah, without having a male <laughs> guy, what they call <laughs> Muharram in Islamic context. So that we cannot, Afghanistan should not be the standard that Absolutely. we aspire to as a nation. We are a, we are a democratic government whereby the constitution, as you pointed out in session 42, has recognized the, 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 the fundamental right of everybody irrespective of the agenda and any form of uh, inclination. So uh, we will continue to advocacy to revive that bill and see that eventually it sees the light of day. Yeah, no, yeah. but that notwithstanding, I would like to be devil's advocate here. Okay. Have you really tried to work with women in legislation? They are not the easiest people. You say with women? Yes. I think that, I mean, yes. I think that it goes beyond working with the women in legislation. I'm looking more at the system, what it means, that the, the system, system the as system. a whole, yeah. especially in 2021, where we have world leaders of leaders. countries, heads of states mm -hmm. as women. Yeah. How can we in 2021 in Nigeria yes. still hold such backward mm -hmm. views? And I do call them backwards. And I often wonder, 
what supersedes in Nigeria? Is it the law of the country or a religious Tradition. or law? I just, I just don't, I, I just don't, I, I don't get it. And I think it's, I think it's just sad. I'm glad that you're a man. And you're the one who is talking said, about yeah. making this case because if we were women, people would be like, "Oh, it's women at it again." So it's yeah. a, it's a good thing. Mm. As a woman, I know what it is to, you know, to have that bias used. For instance, do you know? I don't know now, but do you know that you cannot even apply for Nigerian passport as a woman without either your husband's consent, consent. or your father? It's ridiculous. In okay. 2000, and you, you, you didn't know that, did I you? Know. Yeah, because you're a man. Nobody's going to ask you. <laughs> yes. But yes, so did your husband, your husband has to sign something, or your father. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm a widow and I'm an orphan. I, 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 so so where do you get no, I think I think it's not that. Maybe it must have changed because I know quite. I hope I've seen it's, quite some it has changed, but I actually went through it. And then if you are a woman and you're trying to apply for your children, children you have to have the father's consent. Do you understand? Yeah. And that's yeah. just mm. the basic. Yeah, that's, that's just the that that system that is so entrenched in society. Yeah. But you see, I think it goes also because of the fact that um, li um, law and custom are really head to head here because you're a lawyer yes it's head to head so even when you get an edge in the legal side you have the custom running up so next to you and you know yeah, changing it the customs will change mm. and should change mm. can't even but we can't mm. seem to but do that you know, know what is funny it's funny woman, how you know, in some instances the culture wins because it suits our purpose it suits at that our time. purpose mm. we're not consistently choosing no. culture in no. the things that really matter to the men exactly, they, they, exactly. they're not choosing culture uh, speaking of how this whole thing is uh, is even beyond the nigerian context I was watching an interview the other day on same Al Jazeera. Then it was Antonio Guterres, the current United yes. Nations Secretary General. So the journalist asked him that, when are we going to have the first female Secretary, Secretary General? Yeah. No, he now said, that when will we have the next Madam General? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Antonio Guterres was shell shocked. He couldn't answer the question. Yeah. So he owned up to him that, yeah, we understand that this issue is also in the United Nations mm -hmm. and that we'll continue to see how we <laughs> it's it. everywhere. So it's the global <laughs> that we keep talking about. It's so <laughs> yeah, it's worse in uh, Nigeria. Uh, yeah, perhaps, yeah, it's worse, it's not just more. Nigeria, in some in countries. Some countries. Yeah. Especially where religion plays yeah, such yeah, a role. Since, since we are playing the religious card, yeah. the Bible and the Quran mention prominent women mm -hmm. that had Fatima. expressed leadership. Yeah. So they should stop deceiving themselves. Yeah. Going further, yeah. the Bible says that they are neither male no female. female sure no <laughs> sure. sure sure barbados just had a woman leading them into the future yeah. and guess what it was another woman that ha actually had relinquished authority to her yeah. queen elizabeth is a woman relinquished authority even in new zealand woman. in new zealand the woman anderson what's her name again um she's doing well in fact there was a survey of countries that Properly the manage the, con the COVID situation. Yeah. And, we and it was, yeah, it by it was women. So yeah, yeah, women. Well. Okay, but well, let me say something. Okay. I think that while we're talking about all the things that need to change, we must also admit that some things have changed. A lot of the mm. bank um, heads okay, in Nigeria say. recently, mm. they are all we, women. We, we, which yeah, means yeah. that mm. obviously they've, I mean, I hope it's not a political thing. Yeah, and I, I, I hope they're not playing to the I, gallery. I the but these women. Ah, cool. well, I think we have made progress I think between now and the last 10 We are making years. progress, but the yes. problem is that there are some in part of key, the country, key. some part of the country, some persons from some part of the country yeah. are okay. trying to drag us backward, yeah. while some other parts are moving forward. Uh -huh. yeah. I agree so that's with where you. the problem I agree with is. You. Yes. I agree with but you. that notwithstanding, I mean, I know that women in places like um, Cross River, um, Ogoni Land, mm -hmm. and things like that, yeah, they, are women, the uh, they are women, uh, you know, I have a friend, she She's the um, leader of the house, you know, or the... Uh, um, State house? She, no, no. She's the chief of army staff okay. in a government. Chief of staff. Chief, chief of staff. Sorry, chief of staff. And I'm looking at this woman, and I'm thinking, how can she... Because she's, she's a little woman. Mm. From Niger Delta, yeah, so yeah, I can't imagine her strong. standing there and but telling those men to. Yeah, uh, that's so. that's very interesting. But so it should happen until, everywhere. Not until our northern, our northern brothers and sisters mm. experience this, we will mm. keep talking because yeah. um, it's easy for some of them to say, oh, "We'll get married." marry off our girls at the age of nine mm. and then you don't want the girls to go to school imagine <laughs> the religious police mm. in a particular state we mm. sees 
a smartphone from girls, mm. seeing it's wrong for them to do that. I don't that, that, that was this lady who won a beauty pigeon. Miss Nigeria, I think. Yes, a beauty pigeon. And yes. this religious police she said, had to summon her parents to explain mm. why she has, they have to I allow the daughter well. to. So it speaks to how this is more entrenched in some part of the mm. country. And she was, she's like very in beautiful. Parts of the country. Yeah. Yeah. She's a very beautiful. Well, thank you all for your review. Well, a woman should know her place. And our police is in the driver's seat. Mm. We well, thank you for your attention. Why the program lasted? We hoped our conversations resonated with you. Little drops of water they say make a mighty ocean. Don't forget the advocacy continues on our social media platform on Facebook at Plus TV Africa hashtag the Advocate NG and Instagram at Plus TV Africa hashtag the Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the advocate ng don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel plus tv africa thank you for your constant love and support in the past year yes to another amazing year let's keep advocating for a better society see you next time and happy new year once again